Awesome. All right. Well, I, I know, I know most of you, um, we're going to do introductions, um, now, but I just want to thank you guys for being here today. I know that, um, it's really difficult sometimes to take the time to focus on stuff like this, um, because we are working in a very reactive, uh, industry. And so we're just really grateful that you're here with us. Um, and hopefully you will be able to get out a lot of different things that have been really invaluable to us, um, in our careers and also our personal lives. So we are going to throw a ton of stuff at you. I'm thinking that it will not be until 1130 likely more around 1115. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we had that time blocked out for you all in case anyone wanted to stay uh, and ask some questions. Um, so before we get started on this stuff, we will share a little bit about us. You want to go ahead and share? Uh, yeah, I'll give a little intro. And I know a few of you, and I know a few of you know me, but yeah, um, my name is Andrew Gallegos. And, and Jen and I, we are married and we also work together on a mortgage team at New American Funding. Um, have been doing that for the past couple of years together. I've been a loan officer in the Colorado market since 2010. So about 13 years now, uh, helped over a thousand families in that span. Um, you know, top 1% of originators year over year. And um, the reason why I mentioned that is just because like maybe a lot of you, you know, mortgages and my business is a huge part of my life. But, you know, uh, my relationship with my wife and my kids and, you know, um, my health, you know, there's there's a lot of other areas that I like to focus on as well. So, you know, over the years have made just a huge commitment to time management practices because I want to continue to produce at a high level in business, but I also want to you know, be successful in other areas of my life. And I think it's something that Jen and I are really passionate about. Um, you know, we, we, we've been doing a podcast called the head at home podcast since 2019. And one of the main topics that we talk about is time management, efficiency systems, you know, how to be better at our business so that we can also be better in our personal lives and, um, you know, doing all of that and, um, you know, doing it successfully and still being, being sane is, is a big focus of ours. So that's a quick little rundown there. I'm not sure I would say you're sane, but I agree generally, well, you know, for the most part, <laughs> most days. <laughs> um, so I, I would echo what Andrew said just about, um, the reason that we feel so, um, I, I guess this just is so important to us. Uh, I want to give a little background on when I really started becoming really interested in time management. And it was ultimately, and for any of you that are um, listening to our Head at Home podcast, um, I think it's one of the first couple episodes where we talk about this. Um, but Andrew and I had, you know, Andrew was, you know, very successful lender um, back in, it was around 2016. Um, and we had a, a one-year-old and we just had a baby and I went through a lot of health, um, issues that for anyone who's ever been sick knows that when you're sick, it takes up a lot of time. Um, and so in addition to that, I was, um, overseeing discipline and attendance for Jeffco schools that has 160 schools and like 80,000 children. Um, and so that was a, a very, a, a very big job. Andrew had a very big job. We had two babies and we had this huge health thing, um, on our plates. And so what we've really focused on the last, I would say really 10 years is how can we use our time in the best way that we can so that we have time for the things that we really want to make sure that we're doing and being successful at. Um, and so one of the important lessons that I think we've really learned is that you're going to have really difficult things come up in your life. You know, life in general is hard with all the things that go on day to day. And so you have to get really good at how you use your time. Um, and that's why I feel like this is so vital for people to really understand and to be able to use that time that you have in your one life that you've been given um, in the best way possible. So that's why we wanted to share this stuff with you today um, in hopes that you can make little tweaks here and there and feel a little more successful in your day to day. Like I said, I think that, you know, our 
primary focus for this uh, training today is really to make sure that you have more time to focus on those other pieces of your life um, that you want to focus or the hobbies that you have or whatever. Um, and certainly there's better ways to work so that you can work more. But ultimately, you know, there's lots of different pieces of our lives that we want to make sure that we're focusing on. Um, and so really making sure that we can efficiently work in the best way possible and we're spending our time in the best way possible is going to allow us more time to do the things um, that we want and not spend time on the things that we don't want to spend time on. So... Luckily for you, I used to be a high school teacher a long time ago, and so never will I ever start a training without any learning targets. So you're stuck getting these learning targets from me. Um, we are going to talk today about the importance of how you spend your time and manage your time. Um, and then really, I want you to walk away with being able to utilize the ideas and resources that we give you to manage your time more effectively. Like I said, we're going to do, throw a ton of different ideas at you, and my hope is that you can walk away um, with at least three things that you can implement pretty immediately um, to start making some adjustments. So really quickly, um, and we're not going to, I'm not going to have you share out on this, but I want you to take a little bit of time to reflect. By the way, if I don't say this in this training, I don't think we ever give ourselves time to reflect. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to reflect. And I would encourage you to calendar time throughout your week um, to really give little snippets of time to reflect um, because we don't do that. And so it's really hard to make changes if we don't ever give ourselves time to think. Um, but what I want you to do now is just reflect on how good you are at using your time on what you want to spend your time on planning your time and then following through with your plan. So for example, like if you plan to be at this training today, you, you obviously followed through because you're here, right? Um, but if you had to rate yourself from one to 10, generally, what would that number be? 10 being the best. Once you have like a idea of a number, I want you to think of what is one thing that pops up in your head um, that you are spending time on that does not matter at all, okay? And then what are you not spending time on that does matter? Does the submarine story <laughs> I mean, matter? I'll, that doesn't I'll matter. Let, I'll all let right. you answer that. I'm okay, not, cool. not going to tell you what Making to do. Making me feel bad. <laughs> So what I want you to think of um, as we're going throughout this training is how can you, one, improve the number that you um, created just now when we were reflecting, two, find a way to stop spending time on that thing that popped in your head that does not matter to you at all, and three, how can you implement into your calendar the thing that does matter that you're not spending time on? So before we get into kind of time management tools and all of those pieces, um, it's really important for us to actually have like a general consensus uh, or, or a working agreement of what time management is. So the dictionary definition of time management is the ability to use one times effectively, one's time effectively or productively, especially at work. But I would argue any any time because it's like this for everyone, right? Um, and time management is really the process of planning and organizing how to allocate your time to really maximize that productivity in whatever you are doing. Okay. So when I'm talking about time management today, that's what I'm talking about. This is my most favorite quote of all time. I think it's really great for um, real estate agents, mortgage lenders, all, all of those very reactive jobs because a lot of times we wake up with this mindset um, that we just have to do whatever kind of like the world throws at us, right? And so what I want you to really start thinking about how you can wake up in the morning and figure out how you can run your day, because if you don't choose to run your day in, in a way, and please know there are absolutely things that pop up in a day, um, but if you don't want wake up with that mindset that you're going to run the day, the day absolutely will run you, right? And Andrew and I talk about this all the time because um, we have a pretty 
a, a pretty consistent morning routine um, that we really try to implement every day. It certainly does not happen every day. Um, but I am always very aware that if I don't have that morning routine, the day tends to run me a little bit more than I would prefer. And so we're going to be talking about what are those things that we can really strategize around and implement so that we feel like we're in control of our day. And we're not going to just, you know, kind of be like swaying in the wind, depending on whatever is happening to us. So why do we need to talk about time management, particularly in uh, a real estate career? Okay. So lots of things in your jobs, right? You're juggling multiple clients. You uh, have multiple properties. You have within each of those multiple deadlines. Um, and so we have to be really thoughtful and intentional about how you're getting pulled in all of these directions and how your time is being spent. Um, we know that time management is the key to efficient working, right? And so we want to make sure that we're using that time that we have as efficiently as possible. I remember it was, I think it was like right when I, right around when I turned 30, but I remember seeing this quote that was like, everyone has the same amount of time in a day. Um, and when you really start to think about that, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating actually to think about how people choose to use their time differently and the results that come from that. Right. Um, and so we want to make sure that we all have the same amount of time, but we want to make sure that we're really efficiently using that in the, in the best way that we can based on our values. The other thing we want to know, or we want to talk about today is that um, no one's really ever asking you to do your priority. It's usually their priority, right? Um, and so, you know, the emails in your inbox, those aren't typically your priorities, but they're things that people need from you and they might not match what your priorities are. And so you just have to be thoughtful about that. Time management also keeps us away from the someday, someday island. And I think Jim Rohn um, coined that term, but really, you know, we, we all have these goals, like someday I'm going to do this, or someday I'm going to, you know, insert whatever dream or goal you have. And really what we can use in time management is we can structure and strategize a way to incrementally get to that goal that we want to set. Um, and if we're not doing that, then it is going to be kind of like someday, um, and we may get to it, we may not. The thing I love about time management um, and all of these tools that we're going to talk about is it really is a way to practice self-discipline um, or, or teach yourself self-discipline, right? Like it is not, uh, it is not easy by any means to do the thing that's on your calendar that you said you were going to do, right? There's a lot of integrity um, that comes with doing that thing that you don't want to do that's on your calendar. And so that's a really great way to build that tool of self-discipline. And doing the thing that we want, that we should do, whether we want to do it or not, right? Um, we talk, Andrew and I talk to our kids about that all the time uh, to the point they're probably annoyed with us by now, but like, hey, like there are things that we have to do every day that we don't want to do, but that we should do, right? And so we're going to do them regardless of what our emotional, um, what our emotions are telling us to do, but we're going to actually follow through with what we think and we know we need to do. I also think it's important to talk about that when you like follow through with that stuff and you feel like you have control over your day, you feel more positive, right? Like I have, um, I feel much better about myself and much better about my day when I feel like I'm controlling pieces of my day. Um, and so we want to make sure that we really talk about that, like emotional aspect too. Um, because when you feel like you're in control of your time, that really does impact your emotional well-being. So just some common principles about time. We all have the same amount of time in a day, right? And I, I do, I mean, this is like a very philosophical thing to think about, but like, I don't even know how many people are on the world, but like we all use our time differently and there's different impacts of that, right? And so just be thinking about, hey, how am I using my time? How are other people using their time? Do those match up to what I want? from my life and my value. And we're going to talk about values here in a minute. Um, but I think that's really important to match how we're spending our time up with our values. Time is the scarcest resource that we have. Okay. It's not money. It's not anything else. It's time. And we're never getting it back. Right. And so 
if you get really laser focused on making sure that you're getting the most use out of your time or being as intentional as possible, you really are going to be able to get a lot more done than you think. Um, and then we, we kind of talked about self-discipline and self-reliance, um, but the last one is it really teaches you to be results oriented. So one of the things, um, that we do, and I do this, um, like monthly, quarterly, and at the end of the year, um, is reviewing how the month went, like looking at my calendar, did the things that I did during my week actually get me closer to my goals? Okay. Did the things that I did in this quarter get me closer to my goals? And these could be work goals. These could be health goals. These could be relationship goals. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are really focusing on what those results are. <clears throat> One of the best things that I started doing a number of years ago is that the, in December, I actually go back through my calendar and I look at everything that was on my calendar and if there were things or um, people that I was spending time with um, that did not necessarily um, improve my life or that were um, not giving me the results that I wanted or whatever that was, but really being intentional about looking for those results is um, really, really important when we're talking about time management. Okay, so before we get into kind of some specific tools um, that you can use around time management, um, we're gonna just talk a little bit about values, okay? Because I'm a firm believer, whether you whether you say it or not, that your values are very clear in, in how you spend your time, okay? Um, and so we want to make sure that if we know what our value, one, you have to know what your values are. If you don't know what, what your values are, you're not going to be able to figure out how to spend your time. Okay. And I think that's a lot of people's issue is they've never spent the time to really think about what are those things that are most important to me. Um, but once you have those values down, then you can really start figuring out how to build your life and your time from that. Okay. So the first step is knowing your values and your priorities. Um, we have enough time. We just have to adjust our priorities and really figure out and hone in on what those like top few are. Once you know your values, you can set goals from your values. Okay. And, um, I think this is from, and Andrew, tell me if I'm wrong, but Stephen Covey's book start it's, is it start with the end in mind where you really almost like you want to kind of play out your life and think like, where do I want to be in, you know, at the end of my life, like what are the things that I want to have accomplished, whether that's work, whether that's relationships, whatever that looks like. Okay. Um, and then kind of work backwards from there and backwards design it and really try to figure out what you want that to look like. Um, and I think that's one of the seven habits. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all you wanted to Again, say? Yeah. I was, I was confirming that you were, you were correct. Oh, good. I love when I you mute myself that. again. <laughs> Um, the other thing is not majoring in minor things, right? So I, I think, um, and we all do this, right? Like I, I will spend stupid amounts of time doing something sometimes when I'm like, what did I like, why did I just spend 45 minutes doing that? Okay. Um, and so just being like aware that that's something that we do, um, and really making sure that you have in the forefront of your mind that you want to be focusing on those major values or those major goals that you have. And so that you can produce the things that matter. Um, towards the end, end of this training, I'm going to also um, talk a little bit about how to set expectations with people and others about your time. Um, because I think that's one of the most important things that we can do around time management. Like it's fine and dandy if you have all of these ideas about your time, um, but you can't forget about all of the people in your life that are pulling on you. Okay. Um, and so you have to be really thoughtful and intentional about how you're setting expectations with others. Um, and then setting yourself up to say no to the things that don't fall in line with your values or your goals that you have. Okay. So I'm going to give you a few minutes. Um, I just um, screen grabbed this. This is one of my favorite um, lists of values. And guys, just to give you a context of um, my background, I, I don't think I mentioned this in the introduction. So um, a lot of my work uh, in school districts, I do consulting also um, with school leaders around um, leadership development, um, groups, teams, 
conflict management, all of those pieces. So a lot of this stuff, um, I've done a lot of work with leaders throughout the state. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we can do before we ever talk about anything else is really figuring out personally what our values are, because that's going to guide everything that you do in your life. Um, so I'm going to give you all a couple of minutes um, to write down, and, and it doesn't need to be anything fancy. I'm not going to have you share it. This is just for you. Um, maybe a list. I would have you shoot for 10 um, values off this list or something that you think of that are important to you. And then um, I'll give you next steps from there. So take a couple of minutes and try to try to come up with a list of 10 if you can. I know some of you are going to want more, but I really want you to try to stay closer to 10. All right, go ahead and finish up your list. Oops. If you have your list of 10, what I want you to do now, and this will like kill you a little bit, I want you to circle five that are most important to you. And then if you can get down to three, that's even better. And if anyone wants to share their three in the chat, you are totally welcome. I'm not going to make you do that, but, um, you know, feel free to do that. I love that. So family, health, financial stability. That's awesome. All right. So I'm going to um, kind of show you here and you all, please feel free to keep like sharing in the chat if you want. Um, but what I want to talk about is once you have your values, um, what this, what this looks like in this transfer to your calendar. Okay. So for me, um, and you know, I, I would say these are my top three. Um, obviously I have a longer list of five and 10, but my top three, I know that if all hell is breaking loose in my life, that these are the, the three that mean the most to me. Okay. Um, and so, for me, it's number one is health above anything. It's above my family. It's above growth. It's above anything because I know that in order for my um, half broken body to 
um, move throughout this world somewhat normally that I need to make health a priority for me in order for me to be there for my family or in order for me to do anything else. Okay. So the very first thing I'm going to calendar in my day are things related to health. Okay. And that's including physical health and mental health. So for me, that is waking up early in the morning with a morning routine of having time for like a 10 minute meditation um, and gratitude where I just write a list of things that I'm grateful for. And then time for a workout where I, maybe I'm um, reading or doing 10, 10 pages of reading while I'm doing like a, you know, incline workout or whatever, or listening to a podcast, whatever that may be. Um, notice, by the way, how I'm stacking my things that I want to get done. Okay. So I'm getting a workout in and I'm doing something else that is important to me if possible. Um, another thing that I do is just, um, I walk at lunchtime. Um, that is my health, but it's also really important for me to spend time with Andrew. Okay. Outside of us, um, working together. So we have like a little, uh, lunch date every day where we walk, um, and we walk around our neighborhood and gossip about our neighbors. And that's important. That's important to us, right? Like that's what we do as we walk. Um, I also make sure that I'm at my kids activities. So I'm going to have, if you notice in yellow, um, I wish this was all of their activities. That would be amazing. Um, but just as an example of the things that I, at, I want to be at my kids activities. So I'm going to make that a priority. Okay. Um, and then the last one is growth and really the growth one is around how can I get a little bit better tomorrow than I am today. And so that's through you know, reading or learning. And so I just make sure that I really calendar that into my schedule. Babe, do you want to say anything about that, about yours or? Um, no, I think this is great. I think, yeah, identifying the values and then making those time blocks. And for me, you know, a big one is like, you know, business, you know, happiness and, and success of my business, which is really just the happiness and, and success of people that I'm working with. That's my team that's referral partners, that's clients, you know, it's a living thing. And so, um, but yeah, you know, the, the, it's hard to build business, you know, because it's, that's, that's a proactive thing, you know, that's not something that has a deadline to it, you know? So I think those are the things that I try and build early in the day is like, okay, can I spend an hour of reaching out to my database, talking to my clients every single day, because that is the most important part of my business. But you know, I like the Outlook setup. I don't know if you guys use Outlook or, you know, Gmail calendars or whatever, but I kind of like these because you can actually move these blocks around if you have to. Um, so, you know, like that, that workout read podcast block, you could actually just drag that down from, you know, 9 a.m. to, you know, 1 p.m. if you have to. Or, you know, for me, that would be like a prospecting block. If I absolutely have to do something urgent, I don't want to just delete my prospecting block. I'm just going to have to move it down or move it earlier or whatever. But yeah, I think that this, it's almost like a Tetris type thing. I think um, using a calendar like this is really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think once you get in the habit of using your calendar, you're, you'll start to really understand how much time you have for different act, like activities or like if you know you're going to time block prospecting activities. I mean, the goal is to do it when you say you're going to do it, but if something comes up, then you know that it's on there and you can move it down. Right. Cause a lot of times we just like blow through it and we're like, Oh, we know we have to do this today, but it's not on our calendar. So we just kind of forget about it. Um, or we just <clears throat> ignore it, but it's really nice to have that where you can move it and address it later on. And, and not delete it too. I learned yes. that from one of my coaches a while back is like, what I'll do is once I clear a block, I'll just double click on it and turn it to black instead of just deleting it. Like, Oh, I got that done because then you can, if you want, you know, and if you're reflecting, you know, and then you're building your calendar for next week, you can look back at last week and be like, okay, what exactly did I do? At least during the working hours, you know, Hey, did I hit my prospecting blocks or did I not? Where was I spending my time? Because then that can allow you to become more efficient in the next week. Um, another thing that goes along with this is just like I was talking about is all those, all those pieces of your life, right? So you you might have, um, your physical health or your financial health or your professional goals or, um, lifestyle. So this might travel might fit in here. Right. 
um, your mental health, spiritual health. Um, how are you feeling? How are you doing as a parent? How is your marriage? Right. And so the other piece of this that I think is important, just as we talk about values. Um, and one thing that Andrew and I do, um, at the beginning of every year and kind of like throughout the year addressing and talking about it is like, how does your wheel look? Okay. And some years it might, your job, like your professional goals, you might hit those goals, but like you suck it up in another area. Right. And that might be your physical health or your marriage might, you know, not be so awesome that year, whatever. What I really like about this, just this screenshot is it's just a very simple way and it doesn't take a lot of time, but just to like check yourself and say like, how am I doing in all of these areas? And my goal is always to make sure that this is looks as much like a wheel as possible, right? And it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be some areas that suck more than others, but really just being intentional and reflecting on, on that wheel can be really powerful. So you don't get so far down the road, um, that you're able to kind of like address some of the things that may be popping up for you to adjust that wheel a little bit. All right. So we're going to talk about some key tools that you can use in your day-to-day -day life, um, in your job, and also in your personal life um, that can really help you to use your time better. Um, so Andrew mentioned um, in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, he has this idea of these four quadrants. Um, and in these four quadrants, at any sort of activity in your life is going to fall into one of these. Okay. So in quadrant one, you have urgent and important do. Okay. Um, so these are things that like you really need to address immediately. Um, these might be, you know, not emergencies, but you can say emergencies. Um, one of the things though, that I think is important to really talk about in this quadrant is people think that things are emergencies and they are not emergencies. Okay. The best example I can give you, um, is from my old job. I would get, um, when I oversaw discipline, I would get principals. I would work with principals basically all day and they would call me, um, and they would say, I have to talk to you right now. Um, we have a situation. Okay. And, I would call them back and it absolutely was not an emergency. Okay. Because if it's an emergency, I tell them they need to call 911 and call the police because I'm not able to address the situation from my office. Um, and so I think that you have to be really mindful about what emergencies are um, and what are just things that people feel like are really important to talk to you about right away. Okay. Um, quadrant two are those things that are very important, but not urgent. So these are all the things like planning, um, brainstorming, uh, prospecting. prospecting. Yep. Yeah. These are all the things. And I, the way that I think of them, these are the things that no one's going to know if you don't do them. Right. And this is why they're so easy to skip. Okay. Because no one's like requiring it of you. Um, it's not something necessarily that you know, you have to be at a meeting for, right? These are things that like really only, you know, that have to get done. Um, and there's no urgency to them, but they're the most important things that you can do. Okay. This is where you want to spend your most time on is quadrant two activities as much as you possibly can. Quadrant three are urgent, but not important. Okay. So these are things that if you, if you can delegate, um, these might be, you know, like a, um, and Andrew, I'm sure you have some examples too, but this might be like, a, you know, a reimbursement sheet, right? Like, so you have all these like marketing expenses, a reimbursement sheets do, but like, could someone else on your team do that? That would be a good example. Anything else, babe, that you can think of that? You I think that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then quadrant four are those not urgent and not important things. So as much as you can eliminating those. And what I want to say about this is like, there absolutely is a time and place for these things, right? And these are like, these are fun things, okay? Um, but I think making sure that you're intentional, like if you're going to be spending time on fun things, that you are know that that's what you're supposed to be do. doing um, instead of maybe like, you know, going down the rabbit hole of 8 million TikTok videos when you're supposed to be doing um, a prospecting block, right? Or something like that. Um, or, you know, like watching, um, live footage of the 
submarine all day yesterday not to mention any names it wasn't all just, day okay <laughs> um a, a, a nice practice that you can do for quadrant one two is actually write out like what are the things that i would need to drop everything for um that list is probably going to be shorter than you know you you think it might be once you write it out um in into like for me like an important thing is answering the phone when a new lead calls you you, you can also put practices around that you know like if you are in the midst of a prospecting block or a quadrant two activity that you know is very important but it's not urgent but then an urgent or a call comes in and you want to catch that call have a little script to where you answer the phone you you know make that initial contact and then you set an expectation of you know when you're going to call them right back if you do that with people if you answer the phone and say hey thanks so much for calling it's great to meet you take down their information and then just say you know, Hey, I'm in the middle of another project right now. Can I call you back in 15 minutes when I'm done? You know, and then that way you're still, that it's a practice that you can build in to not lose out on those, those urgent situations that we can all kind of get hijacked by sometimes. Uh, another thing that you can do when you have tasks, um, particularly like if something comes up in your email, there's a really great book called Procrastinate on Purpose by Roy Vaden. Um, but these are some questions that he goes through as it relates to different like things that come up during your day. So the first thing is like, can you eliminate the task? Like, is it even actually something that needs to take any of your time whatsoever? Like, can you just delete it? Okay. If you can't eliminate it, is there a way to automate it? Okay. So this can be done in a number of different ways, but can you find a system? Can you find a program? Can you find a person like anything? Okay. Um, where it's automated. All right. And it can just be done automatically. So you don't have to think of it. Um, another thing that I think of is if it can't be done automatically, um, can you automate a task to remind yourself to do it? Okay. Because a lot of times what happens is you're using all of this like brain and cognitive power to remember all this stuff, but can you create a system so that it's automated and that, you know, every three weeks you have to do this certain thing. Um, and it's on your calendar that that can be a really great way, um, to minimize some of that cognitive load that comes up. If, <clears throat> the next question you ask yourself is, can it be delegated? Okay. So can you have someone else do it? Or can I teach someone else how to do it? And I think this is where a lot of times we, we don't um, take this advantage or opportunity um, because it takes time to teach someone, right? And so what we do is we're like, eh, screw it. I'm just going to do this myself. And then you keep saying that over and over, like, eh, screw it. I'm just going to do it. And then it takes so much time. Whereas if we just proactively spent an hour teaching someone on the front end, which takes more time on the front end, then we never have to think about it again, okay? So if you can teach someone to do it, absolutely you should do that. And then the last thing is if you are the one that has to do it, should I do the task now, okay? Or do the task later? And if I'm doing it later, I'm gonna put it on my calendar and then I'm gonna just drop it out of my brain until it comes up on my calendar that I need to address it. Um, Darren Hardy has some really important points from his book called The Compound Effect. So this is another really great book around time management and using our um, time really well. So Darren Hardy talks about um, taking consistently small actions that add up over time. So for example, one of those things that you guys could do, if you're overwhelmed by prospecting, then give yourself an hour or a 30 minute block every day where you're prospecting. And what we know about success and results is that anything done consistently works, right? So like if you are consistently prospecting every day in a small manageable chunk, um, that you're going to see the benefits of that. Okay. So you want to make sure that you can take those small actions, um, that can add up over time. The other thing that he talks about in this book that's really important and something that you should consider um, is tracking your time. So determine how much, and this you can absolutely do this using your calendar. So how much time are you spending on admin tasks or how much time are you um, doing client facing activities? So what is that ratio? Um, and is that working for you, right? saying no to things that are not aligned with your goals. And that's really hard. Um, I think one of the most important lessons I've learned in my life is that 
like when you say yes to something, you're actually saying no, right. To other stuff. And so it's not that you're just saying yes to everything. Like you're always saying no to something. So be thoughtful about what you're saying yes to. Um, I think that's really important, particularly when you don't have a lot of time on your hands, right? You want to make sure that those things you're saying yes to align with your values. And then the last thing that I think is really important that Darren Hardy mentions um, in this book is creating routines that reduce decision fatigue. Uh, one of the most difficult things I think sometimes that we do in our day to day, and especially I feel like this in the summer with my uh, kids at home, is there's there's so many things going on, right? And so when you're constantly shifting things or um, your days don't look similar, you can have a lot of decision fatigue. And so you really want to make sure as much as you possibly can have a consistent schedule for prospecting, have a consistent schedule for client meetings, have a consistent schedule for admin tasks, right? Do you go to the same coffee shop? Like, is that, is that something you can just plan on doing so that you can reduce that decision fatigue that sometimes pops up when we're making all of these choices? Another book I wanted to mention with some really great tips from it. Um, this is from Brian Tracy. I put Andrew's headshot on this slide. That joke never gets old, by the way. You know, I've used it so many times and I'm going to keep using it. Um, so there's a book Brian Tracy wrote called Eat That Frog. And I, th I think this is one of the most important things that you can do, particularly around your uh, mental well-being in your job, um, because what happens is, is we have this really awful, icky conversation we need to have or a difficult task that we need to get done. And we just procrastinate all freaking day around it. And it's like eating us up inside and we're worried about it and we're stressed about it. And he Brian Tracy talks about this idea of eating the frog and what a frog is, is it's your most important, your biggest thing that you have of the day. Okay. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to take care of it first thing. Okay. So if you're having, need to have a hard conversation with someone, just get it done in the morning. And what happens is, is when you get through it and you're like, oh, I lived. Okay. And then two, it opens up all this mental capacity where you don't feel like crap all day, um, worrying about it to address the other things that you need to address. Um, unluckily, a lot of us probably have a few frogs in our days every day. And so you always eat the ugliest one first. Okay. Um, we've taught our kids this and our daughter goes around saying, eat the frog, eat the frog. Um, the other thing that Brian Tracy mentions is this 80, 20 rule. Okay. Uh, I think it also is called the Pareto principle. Um, but essentially what it is, is that 20% of the things that you um, are doing are generating 80% of the results. Okay. So a great example is where do you get the most business from? Have you sat down and considered what are, where are those clients that are giving you the most business or referral partners or whatever that looks like? Um, or what are the, um, you know, are there certain things that you put on for your clients that you get the most referrals from? What are, what are those things? Um, and making sure that you're intentionally spending the time on those 20% of activities the most, right? So that's a really important point as well, because that's going to eliminate a lot of time sucking activities that we don't need to spend time on. Um, another thing he mentions, um, for those of you that are really into like list making, um, I don't use this one as much, but I know for some people it's helpful, um, but prioritizing your tasks by assigning them a letter. Okay. So you almost like make them tier a tiered list. You could also prioritize if you have a lot of clients or properties going on at once, you could kind of tier them out based on um, their level of need. And then... I think this is the last one um, around, related to tools and books. This is a fantastic book. If anyone has not read it, I, I highly recommend this one. Um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, he it talks a lot about what are, how uh, it's all about habits and routines and how can you build um, different habits in your life. And really time management is very directly connected to habits. Um, so there's a couple of things that I want to mention from 
um, this book as it relates to time management. And the first one is habit stacking. Um, so if you are creating in your, in your day, um, you know, and focusing on how to utilize your time better, a new habit. Okay. You want to pair it with an existing habit. All right. So, um, for example, after my, I'll just give you a personal example. Um, I had neck surgery and after my, um, surgery, it was really important for me to do these like particular, like neck exercises. I had to do them like multiple times a day and I kept forgetting. And so what I was like, what do I do at all day? Like I, I am drink so much water. So I'm always going to the bathroom and like, every time I wash my hands, after I go to the bathroom, I'm going to do these neck exercises. And wouldn't you know, I never forgot them because it was tied to an activity that I already did. Okay. That was embedded in my day-to-day -day routine. All right. So that can be something that you can do. Um, and this is a really great way also to stack, um, concurrently. Um, so if you're doing a walk, right. And you want to make sure that you're learning and growing still, you can listen to a podcast or if you're driving, right. Like whatever those things are is what can we do so we can, um, reduce some of that time that we're just kind of like not using as well. That can be a great way to do that. Time blocking um, is a great way to schedule time for quadrant two activities, okay? So it, this would be like prospecting, um, paperwork, whatever that is. Scheduling specific time blocks in your calendar um, that are recurring is a really, really helpful way um, to increase those habits. And then the last one is habit tracking. And I just wanted to show you guys real fast what this looks like. Um, but if you are building new habits, one of, one of the ways that you can do that um, is just write out and hopefully tell me if you can, can't see this because um, I can't see my camera. Um, but you can just make a little chart and write out the habits that you're focusing on and then whether you did them each day, okay? And that can be a great, a great way at the end of the day or the week that you really see how you're doing on that goal of hitting your hitting your habits that you're trying to increase in, in that book that you held up that is uh living your best year ever by darren hardy and i highly recommend that um just because yeah it gives you a what they i think they call it like the weekly rhythm register yep. where you know like you can you can write out the habits that you want to implement into your daily routine reading meditating diet cold exposure, exercise, whatever you want to put in there. Um, and then you can mark it off if you, if you did that, um, and just kind of tying all this into, you know, with like the, the, the implementing a habit, like, I don't really like to read, but I know that reading is important for me to stay like on, on top of the game in in my industry, or, you know, if you're trying to learn a new skill, just if you spend 10 minutes a day on, on reading, after a week, that's about an hour. After a year, that's 52 hours. You know, multiply that by two years or three years. I mean, it really adds up. So I think that that's another idea from the compound effect where it's like this seemingly insignificant um, strategy of reading 10 minutes a day. Seems like it's really not going to matter, but over the span of two or three years, it, it really does make a big impact. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things with scheduling, um, again, you want to start with the end in mind. So where do you want to be at the end of your life or where do you want to be at the end of the year um, or at the end of the month, right? Like really try to think um, further out and then plan weekly based on that. So um, just an example that I can give you that I do is Sunday afternoons. I always set my plan for the week. Okay. Um, and adjust things as needed. Make sure that I am very clear on what my goals are for the week what my schedule is going to look like every day. Um, because I know for me that if it's not scheduled, it's not going to happen. Okay. So if it's not on my schedule, it ain't happening. Um, if there's a task that I have to get done, it gets blocked on my calendar. Okay. Um, again, making sure that you schedule those most important tasks first that align with your values, and then you can fill in from there, but you want to make sure that you really have those. Uh, Andrew taught me this because I, I definitely had a problem of trying to get too many things done in one day, um, but really focusing on like a max of three big items. Um, like what are those three big things that you want to get done each day um, in order to feel like you had success, right? Because after that, you know, more than three is just not always possible. Um, and then one thing I do want to mention in your schedule is 
reflect on if you can compile similar activities all in one day. So if you're doing, you know, if you're prepping social media stuff, can you get that all done in a day? Okay. A great example. And one thing um, we do with Andrew's stuff is I time block on his calendar every six weeks, a large chunk of time where he's going to make a ton of videos and then he cranks them out all, all in the, all at once. Okay. Because what I know about him is that if I had him do that every day, it absolutely wouldn't happen. Okay. And so we just time chunk it so that he gets it all done. Um, in you know, every six weeks and we can just focus on that in a certain day. Again, make sure the next day is laid out before you leave work or you're done working. Um, one thing I try to do is not wait until the end of the day to look at my calendar and see what adjustments I need to make. Um, I try to do it like right after lunch because a lot of times if we wait till the end of the day, we're our, we're done and we're not gonna be as thoughtful about what our day looks like tomorrow, okay? Um, sticking to your schedule as much as possible. I know we talked about that, but having integrity with your calendar um, and really making sure that you're proactively thinking about your time in order to remove those decisions in the moment is really, really helpful. Um, so as much as you can prep yourself and proactively think about what you need to do so that you're not making decisions about your, your daily calendar is really, really helpful. Or the morning of, I, like, if you're like me at the end of the day, like, I have a really hard time setting my schedule for the next day. I'll have certain blocks in there. But like, if you're burnt out at the end of the day, just do it the next morning, but never start the day without a plan. Um, one thing I did want to mention as we're talking, we're kind of wrapping up calendar talk. Um you have to remember that all of your hours in your day are not equal. So there's been a lot of studies um, around this that basically human beings have about three to five hours to be really productive. Um, and so you have to be aware of that because you don't want to put things in your productive zone that don't require a lot of brain capacity. Okay. So the things that I'm putting in my productive zone are those like quadrant two planning, creative prospect, whatever those activities are. Those are going in my most productive zone. Um, the other stuff that I can kind of do, you know, without thinking a whole lot, I'm going to put in the times when I'm like more tired. Okay. Um, for me, my productive zone is like that, like late morning to lunchtime. That might be different for you, but just be aware of when that is for you um, so that you know when to schedule what. Um, just a couple of closing things around time management before we talk about expectations. Um, just some reminders that I think are really, really important. Uh, be accountable to yourself. Make sure you plan a time to think and strategize. Make sure you get a handle over your meetings. Like, are there meetings you do not need to be at? Then you should stop going, okay? Um, get a handle over interruptions. Are there things that, and I, I want Andrew to talk about this here in a second. Um, are there things that are interrupting you when you're working? Um, and then one of the most important things is like, if you're working at a high level in your job, it requires self-care and you have to calendar that into your day. So taking care of yourself um, is really, really important when we talk about working at a high level. Dave, you want to talk about this part? Cause I think this is something you do really well. Yeah. I had a old mentor who compared doing like a application with a client to a surgeon doing a surgery, you know, and he said, if, you know, if, if a surgeon is doing surgery on a human being that hour long that it's going to take them, they're not going to be distracted. The door is going to be locked. They're dialed in. Right. And so it kind of clicked with me like, okay, yeah, if I'm looking at an application or if I'm doing, you know, a numbers review with a client, like, absolutely. Do I not want to get disturbed in any way? So um, what I'll do in a situation like that, that I know needs my utmost attention is I'll turn everything off, you know, um, like for however long I think that task is going to take me, I'll go on airplane mode on my phone, I'll put do not disturb on my email, and I'll completely dial in, you know, to finishing this one task completely, so that I get it done, I get it done right, and I don't have to come back to it. Um, it really, once you can kind of get in the habit of doing that. Now, if you do that, a, a good practice would be to put your out of office on, you know, have like an email response that's going to respond to people 
or have a voicemail set up saying, Hey, um, you know, I'm returning all calls after noon today. You know, if I know that I'm going to be tied up until that time. Um, but when you do that and you start getting in the habit of doing that, you become really, really efficient and, uh, a task that if you're touching it more than once might take you all day, you can get done in an hour, you know, and you can, you can keep, um, minimizing the time that it will take. So yeah, that's, that's my take on that. I think we've talked about that. So I'm going to skip that. Um, a couple things that I, I just wanted to mention, um, again, considering how you guys can, can do some of this stuff. So time blocking for open houses and showings for prep time. Um, so it's not just that you're like writing on your calendar, like, oh, I have an open house this day, or, oh, I have a showing this day, like time blocking prep time for that. Um, some of those important pieces need to be part of your calendar as well. Um, and then just some things to consider, like, is there stuff that you can do virtually to increase efficiency? So like, if you've made a really good connection, um, you know, with a client and, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be done, um, in person, like, is there something that you can do virtually to decrease drive time, right. And get some, get some of that time back. Um, and then again, using technology to help you. So calendars, um, to-do list apps, note-taking apps, time tracking. There's, there's lots of things like once you get into this that you can really utilize. But I think if you're starting, um, kind of like at the novice level, a really great place to start is just your calendar, right? I think that's like a really great place to kind of work, start working. We're going to get into um, a few minutes around expectations, but before we do that, um, I just want you to write down the one thing that you waste time on, okay, that you are going to commit to stop doing for one week. And then I want you to choose one thing that you value, but do not, it can't include anything, babe, that I think is important though. Choose one thing that you value, but do not do often enough. And I want you to, as soon as we're off this call, I want you to implement that into your calendar. And then I want you to think of one tangible next step for long-term that you're gonna take away from this training. So this might be something that you can't implement right away, um, but what is something that you are going to walk away with, like having a concerted effort to doing? I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. Yes, Jen. So um, the um, second thing would be one thing that you value, but do not do often enough. And I want you to implement that into your calendar. So for me, I'll give you an example of this for me this year. Um, when I reviewed my year last year, I realized that I did not, um, I was not being as intentional about spending time with people like friends, um, that I, my friendships, I really valued. And so I have intentionally put into my calendar, um, to reach out to a specific friend, like each month, um, to get together. So that could be something. Can I just touch on the, um, can I bring up the float pool real quick? Yes. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. It sounds crazy, but like, I can't, I don't know about you, but like, it's really hard for me to just turn everything off in the middle of a day. You know, I'm really tied to my phone a lot. Um, so there's this, it's called a float pool. It's a sensory deprivation tank um, that you can like sign up for. There's a few different locations throughout Colorado. Um, but you can, you can go in and basically you go in like this pod and you float because there's like some sort of like certain amount of gallons of salt in there, but it's pitch black. You can't see, you can't hear anything and you can go for 60 minutes or 90 minutes. And so if you're looking for a way to like force yourself to reflect, um, I would recommend doing that. Um, when we talked about values earlier, you know, I think that what a lot of people, you know, miss or that I have kind of realized over the years is that values change. So your value today might be different than, or your values today might be different in six months, you know? So if you can, if you go to a float pool once every three months or once a month or once every couple of weeks, however long you want to do that, take the time to reflect in there. And then usually what comes to my mind is like, okay, what are three values that I need to be focusing on right now? 
And then I kind of walk out of there thinking like, okay, now I have these, I have this idea of what's most important in my life right now and where I need to really pay attention. And then you can just go and implement that into your, you know, your routine or your calendar. But I think reflection is really, really important and we definitely don't do enough of it. All right. Sounds weird. No, I, I mean, it is weird, but like, just try it. It is. I, I really like it. You, Andrew does it way more than I do. Um, but yeah, if anyone's interested in it, you guys can shoot me an email or text me and I can give you, there's a few different places that you can go around town. Um, okay. So I want to talk really briefly about setting expectations. I think this is, um, and I actually have like an hour long course on setting expectations, but I want to just throw in a couple pieces because it does relate to, um, how we manage our time because people do pull on us in, in different places. So, um, if, if you could just walk away, remembering one piece of information around setting expectations, it's really front loading. Um, you, a lot of times what happens when people get frustrated with you or um, you get frustrated with other people is you have not done a good enough job setting expectations with the person um, and there's some confusion, right? And so as much as you can front load what, what you need to front load with them, um, that can really help with reducing some of that like confusion or disappointment that can pop up. So when I'm talking about expectations, um, really making sure that we're setting expectations on the front end is a way to teach people how to work with you and what to expect. So um, th it, it, it's actually really, really helpful. Um, and we want to make sure that we're trying to teach them as early as possible so that they know how to work with us. Um, and you want to make sure to tell people how you work and then how to communicate in the best way with you, right? And whatever that is, we want to make sure that that's clearly defined. So when I'm talking about setting expectations, um, I also sometimes call it the truth, right? So why is it so hard to tell someone the truth? Or why is it so hard to, to set expectations with someone? There's lots of reasons. Um, you're scared to lose business, right? You don't want to hurt their feelings. Um, the person is scary, right? And you may feel like it will cause a conflict and you hate conflict. You don't want to sound like a bee face. Um, you don't know how to do it. Um, there's lots of different reasons that we all have, um, but really when we learn how to set expectations and create those structures in order to do that um, and allow for feedback, it really creates less frustration in whatever process it is. It could be in a relationship, it could be at work, whatever that is, but it provides more clarity for all parties um, and, and can be really helpful when you're talking about adjusting some of those time management pieces that you're wanting to adjust in your life. Yeah. A quick example, you guys, just because being in our industry, like, and especially in a market, like we're in right now where business seems to be few and far between, um, there is a fear, you know, of like, of, of setting your expectations and kind of implementing your way to do business. So just one of the things that I do on on just the initial phone call with a client is uh, I do like a like an interview. So it's it's typically like a twenty to thirty minute call where I learn about them, I find out what their goals are, um, because I'm not going to be able to help them achieve those goals if I don't know what they are. But in that call, I also have a script that I wrote out that breaks down every step in my system, and I just start that script with saying, "Hey, here's how I work." And then I break down, hey, we're going to spend a few more minutes over the phone right now. I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to take some notes. When we're done with the call, I'm going to send you an email. That email will have a request to, for you to fill out a loan application and submit your documentation. Then I explain to them, hey, once you get that information into me, I'm going to review it. I'm going to put together loan options. And then we're going to, we're going to schedule a meeting to review those together. And then I send them, I, I tell them how long that's going to take me. Hey, it might take me a one business day. It might take me up to three business days just so that they're prepared. And if you do that in that very initial conversation of how long does your process take to get them the information that they're looking for, it's just, it's a great way to do it because a lot of people that we're working with, they're very emotional, right? They see a house, they want to make an offer today, but they might not understand everything that goes into that, you know? So as professionals in real estate and in, in mortgages, you know, we have to be able to, tell them the right way to do it 
so that we're not putting them in a situation that um, is going to be harmful to their, you know, financial situation, or, you know, that's just going to knock them out of being able to achieve their goals. So just thought I'd throw that example out there too. Uh, if anyone's looking for a really good book, um, I always recommend this to leaders. And I think this is absolutely a great book for you all too. how to say anything to anyone. Um, and it's, I I've read a lot of different books around having difficult conversations, but this is by, by far one of the best ones. Um, and so if you're interested in that, that can be a really great book to look into. And we're going to talk about, um, what some of the ideas that are in that book really briefly, um, but really remembering that setting expectations and norms for providing and receiving feedback, whether that's someone that you work with that's on your team um, or a client is really important, okay? And one of the things that we have to remember is that our clients or the people we work with are not you, right? And so you can't make assumptions about how we operate or how they're going to operate. So we need to tell them what we expect and ask what they expect from us, okay? And really, this is the agreement that will guide you through this process with, with whoever, okay? Um, and the setting expectations for how and when feedback will be given does a few things. So it removes emotion out of the equation. A lot of times what we try to do is um, all of a sudden set expectations when everyone's fired up and that's like not gonna work, by the way. Um, and so we need to make sure we're doing that proactively. It also eliminates guesswork, right? So what Andrew said is he upfront, like very explicitly says, this is how I work. This is what I do. Um, and it eliminates any guesswork for what a client is thinking Andrew may or may not do. Um, most of your clients are not going to tell you what they need or when they're unhappy. Okay. Um, they might just gut it out, uh, waiting for things to improve, or they may leave who knows. Okay. Um, but they're not, they're not typically going to explicitly say that. Um, so we want to make sure that we kind of eliminate those issues by proactively saying our expectations on the front end. Um, and really doing that you guys builds trust. Okay. Um, so I, over the years have led lots of, lots of people. Um, and one thing I've learned is that when we say what we need, that that really is a way to build trust and credibility with people. Um, we listen best to the people we trust. So if your clients trust you, they're going to listen. Okay. Um, and they're going to listen to people they think have their best interests at heart. And so really know that this is very connected, um, to your relationships with your clients. And that's why it's so important, um, to do a lot of this work. Um, so an example of something that you could say when you're setting expectations with clients is as your agent, my job is to help you get, get you the house that you want. And as a result, I'm going to let you know about anything that either contributes to you getting the house or that may get in the way of it. Right. So opening that window for you to be able to say, different things that you maybe would feel uncomfortable saying. Um, but that can be an example of a way that you could set expectations with clients. So when you're setting expectations, just a couple of reminders. Again, defining your role, you need to make sure you set expectations around that. Like what specifically is your role? How are you gonna communicate and when? Um, what are the timelines with the whole process of buying a house, right? People don't necessarily know that. Um, you might want to set expectations around market conditions. What are your fees? What boundaries are you setting? Like, is there a time that you are absolutely unavailable? Like, don't, don't not tell them. You want to make sure that you really clarify in the front um, so that they're aware of that. Um, one thing that I think is always important, and this again, builds trust and credibility in any situation that you're working in, um, but making sure that you open that door for feedback from your clients or people that you work with. So an example of this would be, I'm committed to my professional development and I'm always looking for growth opportunities. And I hope if you hear me say or see me do anything that gets in the way of how I want to be seen or how I do my job that you will tell me. Um, and I'll be receptive and say, thank you. And I, of course, hope you will tell me things that I do well that are in line with your expectations as well. So just opening that door and letting them know that, that you're open to feedback too is, is really important. We had, um, 
or uh, an agent that we work with and I, I think it was at the end of the, um, and at a closing, like he always talks to his clients and asks for, asks for feedback. Um, I'm thinking of one babe that we talked to. I, I can't remember exactly, yeah, but it's been really, I think it was Chad. Yeah. 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 No. And I think it's good to yeah open up that line of communication. Another thing too, that I'll always do and that you can do if maybe you don't get the, your, your system out or the way that you work out, you know, on, on a, on a phone call, you can just make a video text, you know, and just say, Hey, it was great chatting with you. You know, wanted to put a face behind the name and also just reiterate the way that this works, you know, here's the next step. And, you know, that way they have something that they could go back and watch and it kind of covers you too, to make sure that they understand how you work and, you know, they know what to expect. One thing I just want to mention um, with setting expectations is it's really important to like alongside this whole process um, is make sure you're building relationships. So you want to make sure that you're building connections with these people and you might be asking, you know, infor informal questions to like build connections between the two of you. Um, but that's really going to solidify that foundation for the relationship when if potentially something difficult comes up. But that's really, really important to make sure that those connections and relationship building pieces are there. Um, I do want to say this really quickly, um, and I think we we do this um, more in particular with people that we work with. Um, but feedback is really invalidated when we don't trust the source, um, and so we want to make sure that we do our best to avoid these things that can pop up. So. Um, gossiping, breaking your word, not telling the truth, withholding information. Those are things that can really like break a relationship. And so we want to make sure that we avoid, avoid that. So once you set the expectations, now you can give feedback. So if there is a situation with a um, person that you work with that is really causing issues with your time or whatever that is, or um, a client, if you set and front load expectations, now you can give feedback. And I'm going to give you just like a general script for that. But before I do that, and we wrap up, just remember, you can give feedback when you've told them that you're giving it. If the incident has happened recently, um, you're not giving it when you're annoyed. <laughs> okay, so time is your friend. Um, if you haven't set the expectation that you're going to, and you're not giving feedback in front of others ever, ever. Okay. Um, the other thing is when you're giving feedback, you want to make sure it's very specific. So you don't want to ever make general, uh, give general feedback. And here's the feedback formula. Okay. So you're going to introduce the conversation by what you're going to talk about and why you're going to empath empathize with the person. Okay. So you're going to, you know, say, I understand this is happening. You're going to describe the observed behavior, share the impact of the result of the behavior. Um, Here's where you might have dialogue and ask for their um, what they perceive to be happening. And then you're going to make your request of what you need and then build an agreement and then say thank you. OK, so again, using the, and this can be used in any situation, um, but really making sure that you follow this formula can really create a better conversation when you are in a place where you need to give feedback. Um, I did want to just let you know, and I'm going to send this out to you guys. And I know there's a couple people that couldn't stay the whole time and some others, um, but I'm going to send this out and I have, you won't be able to see it in here, um, but I have some videos that you can go through and see Sherry Harley actually give feedback on different things. Um, and they're great videos. So if this is something that you're really working on, um, I encourage you to check those videos out, but I will send a recording of this training, um, the slides from this training that will include those videos. Um, and then we'll also put it up on our podcast, the audio of this. So if you would prefer to listen to it down the road, you can do that too. So I wanted to leave a few minutes. If anyone had any questions, um, oh yes, Jennifer, I see. I would totally be happy to set up an expectation. Maybe we'll do that as our next training is a longer expectations one. It's really good. Anyone Thank you guys happy? for joining. Yeah. Thanks for being here, you guys. And um, we'll stay on if anyone has any questions, but we appreciate you coming.